Hi everyone, I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. I've been a space and astronomy news journalist for over 20 years. This is our News Bites segment where we break down a lot of the big news stories of the week in space and astronomy and deliver them in a bite sized format. Now this is just a snapshot, a tiny version of the much longer email newsletter that I write every week that goes out on Fridays, but we get it. Not everybody wants to read a lot of text. Sometimes you just like to have the news videoed at you. And that's what this is. So let's get into the news. It's almost time for James Webb's pictures. All right, you've all been waiting. You've been so patient, so patient. And the waiting is almost over. We know that on July 12th, we're going to get to see the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope. And we got a bit of a sneak preview, I guess, a reaction from the scientists who are gathering the images. They had a hour long conference news conference this week, where various team members talked about what they're working on, how their progress is going and what their reactions are to the pictures that they saw. And they got very emotional and reacted to the new images that they're getting out of James Webb. And we don't know exactly what they took pictures of. But from what we can tell, they took an image, a deep field image, probably several days worth of observations trying to do a mimic of what the Hubble deep field gives. So we should see galaxies, the kinds of things that are just too far away for Hubble to see, we should be able to see those galaxies. And we're talking about galaxies that are just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, incredibly deep. And yet these images are so far shifted into the infrared spectrum that Hubble can't see them. But now James Webb can. And then the other image that we're likely to see is going to be an analysis of an exoplanet's atmosphere. So in this case, James Webb was able to watch as a planet passed in front of its star was able to detect the chemicals in the atmosphere of this planet and give some kind of understanding about what the atmosphere is made out of. We got two other pieces of information about the capability of James Webb. One is the sensitivity of the optics. They were hoping for two micron sensitivity and they were able to get to 1.1 micron sensitivity. So essentially double the quality of what they had originally designed for. And that was a bit of a surprise they were quite excited about that. Literally, the limits now are just the laws of physics. The telescope is perfectly positioned. The mirrors are doing their job exquisitely well. And so that was wonderful. The other thing is the quality of the orbit that it was put into by the European Space Agency on the Atlas V rocket. We got the news that the, the orbit is so good that we're probably going to see 20 years of life out of James Webb and not the 10 years that was originally planned. So good news on both of those parts. So again, we're almost there. July 12th, we will get a chance to see these images. And if you want more information, I actually did a fascinating interview with Lee Feinberg, who is the manager of the James Webb Space Telescope. He has been there for 20 years watching over this telescope through its development, through its operations, launch, and gave a behind the scenes interview with me on the weekly space hangout, where we talked about it for about half an hour. And honestly, it's one of the most compelling, fascinating interviews I think I've ever done. So you're definitely going to want to check it out over on the weekly space hangout. NASA is looking into nuclear power for the moon. When you talk to engineers working on space exploration projects, their top three priorities are power, power and power. And that's because it's really hard to get electricity for all of the experiments that you're running all of the if you've got an ion engine, you need propulsion. And so when you think about a base on the moon, that's going to have human beings living there, they're going to be having all their lighting, all their heating, all of their cooling, all of their equipment, electronics, etc. They're going to need a ton of power. And right now, there's solar power. But that's probably not going to give them enough energy, especially when the moon goes into the nighttime where it can be in darkness for two weeks. And so NASA is looking to develop a fission reactor that can go to the moon. And this week, they announced that they've given out three awards to three different companies of for $5 million. And so they've given an award to Lockheed Martin to Westinghouse and a collaboration called IX. And so the three teams 
have 12 months to write up proposals for a 40 kilowatt nuclear fission reactor that can sit on the surface of the moon for 10 years. And if this works, then we could see similar developments for spacecraft for Martian habitats as well. So it's probably going to be one of those key technologies that will be needed for deep space exploration. Rocket Lab launches Capstone. This week, the New Zealand company Rocket Lab launched their electron rocket carrying a NASA Capstone CubeSat mission. And this mission was being sent to a lunar rectilinear halo orbit. And this is an orbit that goes near the moon. It's not orbiting the moon, but it sort of is orbiting near the moon. Over the course of about seven days, it gets as close as about 1600 kilometers of the moon, and then it flies back out to tens of 1000s of kilometers away. And this is the same orbit that NASA's Lunar Gateway is going to be following when it is launched later on this decade. And so the purpose of the capstone mission is to really to just test out if this orbit is feasible, if it makes sense, does it work? And the idea with this specific halo orbit is that you can fly to this orbit with less energy than it would take to actually go to the moon. And then it's relatively low energy to go from the station down to the moon. So we're going to have this spacecraft make its way to these this halo orbit, follow along the tracks, they're going to be able to see if it is truly stable. And then this is the place that we'll see the lunar gateway fly in the coming years, the crater for a mysterious booster rocket that crashed into the moon has been found. Earlier this year, back in March, I think we reported that a booster was detected on a collision course with the moon. And the astronomers who found it originally thought that maybe this was going to be the booster from NASA's Discover rocket, which was launched on a SpaceX Falcon 9. They did more analysis and actually were able to tie it to the Chang 5 mission, which of course, returned a sample from the moon earlier this year. And so they were watching and expected that it was going to crash in within a couple of weeks of when they made their detection, but it was on the far side of the moon. And so we weren't able to see it. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter finally spotted the region and was able to take a picture of the crater. And what they found was kind of surprising. It wasn't just a single crater, it was a double crater. And so what they think happened is that whatever this booster was, it broke up during its flight, maybe through tidal interactions with the moon. And crashed into the moon in two places that are sort of overlapping. So it's an interesting picture, interesting to see from the original discovery through to the actual impact onto the moon. And hopefully, maybe this will be a place where astronauts will go and visit in the future and study it because it'll be a fresh crater to show recently unearthed regolith. NASA is now able to boost the International Space Station. This week, the Cygnus cargo spacecraft detached from the International Space Station and burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. But before it did, it provided a boost to the International Space Station, raising its orbit. During its perigee, it got an extra 0.8 kilometers. And during its apogee, it got an extra 0.2 kilometers. And this is really important because up until this point, the only way to boost the orbit of the International Space Station is to use Russian technology. There's the thrusters on board the Zvezda module, as well as the various Soyuz and Progress spacecraft that attach to the International Space Station. And all of the boosts have been done with these spacecraft. And so now for the first time, NASA has used one of their cargo vessels to actually provide this boost. And the reason is because the Cygnus has gimbaled engines. And so it's able to direct the thrust as it raises the altitude of the International Space Station. The SpaceX Crew Dragon doesn't have these gimbaled engines, so it can't do it. And in theory, the Boeing Starliner is going to be able to do the same thing. So at this point, NASA is no longer reliant on Russia to be able to keep the altitude of the International Space Station. So that's a relief. Now, theoretically, the Crew Dragon can help boosting. It has the Super Draco engines that it uses for its abort system, but it's sort of not designed to do that. But Elon Musk has stated in the past that he's more than willing to help engineer a solution that will give Crew Dragon the ability to help boost the space station. So hopefully there'll be lots of redundant ways to keep the station aloft. If you like what we're doing, 
why don't you consider joining our Patreon? This is our members exclusive community that you can join. We've got behind the scenes videos, interviews with the team, you get all of our videos ad free. And if you sign up, I will remove all of the ads from the universe today website for you for life. Even if you stop becoming a patron, you'll never see an ad on universe today. Again, you can join this community, go to patreon.com slash universe today. If you are interested with interviews behind the scenes with our team, I just interviewed Andy Thomaswick, who is one of the writers for Universe Today. He's a mechanical engineer and so specializes in a lot of space flight and technological problems. And it was really interesting to sort of hear his process, the kinds of stories he's looking for, and how he goes about his writing. So if you're interested in that, check out the Patreon feed. The interview is publicly available. You just have to follow the link in the show notes to get there. The sun is getting really active, but don't panic. Astronomers this week saw a very large sunspot group on the surface of the sun double in size over the course of just a couple of days. And this giant sunspot group was pointed directly at Earth. And that's important because we seem to see these giant flares and coronal mass ejections blast out of these sunspot regions on the sun. And the sun is going through its 11 year cycle of activity and it's on the upslope. It's getting more and more active as it heads towards its solar maximum. And so we're going to see a lot more of these giant sunspot regions. We're going to see a lot more of these flares and coronal mass ejections. Now we didn't get a flare blast at the Earth this time around. And now this giant sunspot group has rotated away from pointing directly at us. But other ones are showing up every few days. And so it's just a matter of time before we get some of these flares blasting at the Earth. But don't panic. Generally, all we get are really cool auroras. And so if you've ever wanted to see an aurora with your own eyes, and you live in the northern hemisphere, this is your chance you, there's lots of websites that will tell you about the space weather that's currently happening. And you can get alerts when we're expecting to see some kind of Aurora activity in the sky. So then when you hear about one of these Aurora alerts, then go outside at night. If you live in the northern hemisphere, try and find a place that you can see the horizon to the north. If you live in the southern hemisphere, look to the south, and you may very well see auroras in the sky. If you've never seen an Aurora, over the next couple of years, this is going to be your chance. Another reason to not panic, no asteroid impact in 2052. In August last year, astronomers at the Mount Lemmon Observatory detected the asteroid 2021 QM1. And they made some quick observations before the asteroid went behind the sun. And from what they could tell, this asteroid over the next 30 years or so had a pretty significant chance of striking the Earth getting uncomfortably close to the Earth in 2052. So then they had to wait, because the asteroid was behind the glare of the sun. And so they queued up some time on the European Southern Observatory's very large telescope. This is an eight meter telescope, one of the biggest telescopes on planet Earth. And the moment they were able to see it coming out of the glare from the sun on the other side, they made observations. And this was really tricky. This is the faintest asteroid observation that's ever been made. They were able to see magnitude 27. And you astronomy nerds out there will know that is ridiculously dim. They were then able to make a bunch of follow on observations and calculate the future movement of this asteroid. And so it's not going to get dangerously close to the Earth in 2052. It's going to get delightfully close where we can make observations of it as it goes by. So again, another asteroid threat goes to zero. But there's still about another 1377 asteroids on the asteroid tracking list that are of potential concern. That is a lot of asteroids. But we'll have a lot of time and hopefully people will figure out some new technology so that we can nudge potentially dangerous asteroids out of the way in the far future. So stay tuned. Uh, more news on this coming eventually. Astronomers find a brand new pulsar, maybe younger than you. Astronomers were analyzing a dwarf galaxy that's about 400 million light years away. 
and they detected a pulsar in that galaxy. Pulsar, of course, is the remnant of a supernova, a much more massive star than our sun explodes. It leaves behind this, this rapidly spinning, dense object that is blasting out radiation on a very regular basis. They're quite easy to spot compared to other objects out in space. And follow on observations from 2018, 2020 2022 kept seeing this object. So they knew it was there. And then they went back to a survey that was taken back in 1998. And the pulsar wasn't there. And so what this means is that this is a brand new object, it is probably less than 20 years old from 98 through to 2022. And it could be as young as 14 years old. Now it's possible it's a little older than that, maybe 50 to 60 years, if shortly after its explosion, it was enshrouded in dust, and that dust has finally cleared out. But still, astronomers have never found a pulsar this young after the actual supernova explosion, we might know how we get magnetars. Last week, we talked about magnetars. And this week, there was a really interesting paper that talks about what could be the root cause of magnetars. Now magnetars are another kind of neutron star. But they have these just incredibly powerful magnetic fields, they can be hundreds of millions of times more powerful than any kind of magnetic field that we can generate here on Earth. If you got too close to a magnetar, it would dismantle your atoms at an atomic level, because it would overcome the bonds holding your, your atoms together. It would be a bad way to go. Astronomers were scanning the sky, and they found a magnetar that was behaving like a pulsar. Pulsars can spin hundreds of times a second. And this magnetar had a spin rate of 80 milliseconds, which is incredibly fast. And no magnetar has ever been seen with this rapid rate of spinning. And so this means that this magnetar is probably very young. And in fact, the astronomers think that it probably came from the collision of two neutron stars. And Unfortunately, the impact was too far away for the LIGO observatory to pick it up. But it was very, very recent. And so this is starting to lead the idea that how do you get a magnetic field that is this strong, you get it from two neutron stars colliding, and they whip up the magnetic field in their surrounding area. And that's how you get magnetars. A new map of Mars. Planetary scientists working with the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter have pieced together 51,000 separate images taken by the spacecraft showing surface minerals on the surface of Mars. On the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, there is an instrument called CRISM, which is the Compact Reconnaissance Imager for Surface Materials. And this instrument is designed to see the various minerals on the surface of Mars. For example, things like olivine or iron bearing compounds or potentially water bearing compounds. And the CRISM instrument uses cryo coolers to keep itself cold and the last cryo cooler failed in 2017, which has limited the number of observations that this instrument can make. And so engineers working with Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter have pulled together a set of images 51,000 separate images, which are a mineral map of the surface of Mars, it's over 80% of Mars. And in this you can see dozens of different kinds of minerals, the whole download is many gigabytes in size. So if you're gonna want to download it, you definitely can but just be ready. It's a very large image. And this sort of goes nicely with the map of the moon that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And so now you can get a mineral map of the moon, and you can get a mineral map of Mars just in case you want to start your your space mining company. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is just a subset of all of the really cool stories that we're covering over on universe today. And so if you want the full list, every week, you're going to want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. This is a magazine sized document that I email out every Friday, I write the thing myself, it goes out to 50,000 people, there are no ads in it at all. So if you want, check that out, go to universe today.com slash newsletter. And if you are too busy to be able to watch videos here on YouTube, you can also have an audio edition of everything that we do with universe today, all the interviews, all of the news, all of the question shows, everything, just go to universe today.com slash audio or search for universe today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts. 
Thank you to everyone who already supports us and a special thanks to all the interplanetary researchers, the interstellar adventurers, and the galaxy wanderers. Your support means the universe to us. All right. Those are all the stories this week. I hope you enjoy and we'll see you next week.